Well, uh, yes, I hope you all know the story of the prodigal son. Uh, it goes something like this. Um, Nemo gets pissed off with his dad, heads down to uh, Sydney for a, for a while with his mates, carouses around there for a while, but uh, uh, then feels a little bit remorseful and goes home to live with his dad and uh, 400 brothers called Marlon Jr. or something like that. Well, something like that anyway. Um, we know the writers of Nemo really didn't do Reef Fish 101. We know that, uh, that uh, most juvenile reef fish, uh, they don't live at home with mum and dad. The mum might lay the eggs on the, the bottom, um, they, but they then hatch into these minute uh, larvae, just a few millimetres long. And uh, these larvae just disappear into open water away with the currents. Or do they? Um, that idea has pretty much underpinned how we think uh, reef fish populations work, certainly through the 60s, 70s, 80s and through to the 90s, the idea that basically um, we have isolated reefs with resident populations connected pretty much by larval dispersal in a down current um, direction and the idea that any of these babies might end up on the same reef as their parents is seen as, as, as a relatively trivial doesn't, option that doesn't really happen. Uh, very often. And that, this also underpins pretty much the way we still think about these populations and we're managing uh, reef fish populations. Um, but really, for, for most of that period that we, we had that idea, we really haven't had a lot of information on what larvae do and uh, certainly where they end up and where they go has been something that's been shrouded in mystery. Uh, towards the end of the 90s, towards 2000, information began to emerge from actually quite a few new techniques which were uh, being developed that maybe a lot of these larvae aren't going as far as we originally thought, thought on the uh, currents. Um, a lot of them may be ending up back on the same reef as their parents. Uh, things like population genetics, um, some of the modelling work, otolith ear chemistry and even tetracycline tagging of uh, larvae. And, um, Originally, this was treated with a little bit of scepticism. Um, it was misinterpreted as people saying that actually all the juveniles end up on the same reef as their parents. Um, now, if you take a look at the data that's accumulated over the last 10 years, there's been a lot of studies that now have published reasonably reliable estimates of percentage self-recruitment. So this is the proportion of the juveniles that are settling on a particular reef that are derived from parents on the same reef. And we always get, in all of these studies, using different techniques, um, quite high percentages of self-recruitment. Um, but they're never 100%, okay? In fact, if you took an average of all of these studies, or a lot of these studies, it's about 50%. So that really begs the question, where are the other 50% coming from? How far are they traveling? And uh, these are the kinds of questions that we're, we've been addressing over the last little while, particularly in relation to marine protected areas and how they are protected area networks and how they function. Um, interested in, uh, you know, how much are individual reserves, for example, self-replenishing? Um, how many of the recruits that end up in a, in a blue zone or a fished area are coming from a protected reef? So we get that sort of spillover uh, uh, recruitment supplementation. And you know, yeah, how much movement of larvae is there actually between different green zones or different protected areas? So uh, in other words, have we got some sort of um, system that really is functioning as a network? Um, so the problem we have really is that we don't have a good estimate of the dispersal curve for uh, species, uh, uh, fishes. We don't really have a scale on the x-axis with regard to dispersal um, distance and uh, we don't know what it looks like and we don't really have a technique that's capable of measuring it over the entire range that things might be dispersing. So we've got techniques like uh, modelling and chemistry and population genetics that they seem to work on really big scales but if the la fish larvae aren't really going very far uh, there's a big challenge for these techniques in terms of bringing them down to, to measure the, the smaller scale dispersal. Uh, we've taken the other approach of actually trying to start at square one and actually tag larvae or measure 
uh, what they're doing on a relatively small scale because we had some sort of idea that if they're not going very far, well, maybe we'll have some success down here. And the challenge for us has been really how far up can we take this approach of tagging to, to describe the, the nature of connectivity on reefs. Um, when you think about uh, what sort of scale we need to be able to do this, I'll just show you a picture of the Great Barrier Reef in terms of the spacing of uh, uh, reefs in white and the spacing of green zones in uh, green here. And uh, basically the point is that reefs, most reefs are really only one or two kilometres from another reef. So if we're going to be looking at connectivity between reefs, it's a relatively small scale that we want to measure. Most green zones, in fact, are pretty close together as well. The average distance between the green zones on the Great Barrier Reef is something like 15 kilometres, so it's pretty hard to actually get away from a green zone, and we want to be able to measure that connectivity on that kind of scale. Um, the techniques I'm going to be talking about, the first one is stable isotopes. We discovered that you can actually inject trace amounts of stable barium isotopes into female fish. They will pass on this tag through the egg into their offspring, and this ends up as a tag in the center of the otolith, the, the material that goes into the core of the ear bones of the offspring comes from the mother, and so this provides an unequivocal tag for these juveniles, and we have uh, multiple barium markers, and we can use other compounds as well. And uh, the good thing about this is it doesn't seem to affect the offspring too much, and. Uh, uh, the other thing is that the female will continue to tag multiple batches of eggs after, after that event. Uh, the other approach is basically parentage analysis or paternity analysis. We're basically DNA fingerprinting the uh, adults um, and then sampling juveniles and basically matching the juveniles to their parents, um, which you can do. And the good thing about this is if you find them again, it gives you an exact, we know the exact distance that a juvenile is dispersed away from its parents. Um, but it's expensive and you do need to sequence large numbers of microsatellites. The historical progression of what we're doing, we're basically going to individual populations, trying to capture as uh, and uh, fin clip as many of the adults as we can in those populations. And uh, if we do that, then we can sample the juveniles, we can measure what's the self-recruitment, we know who's coming in from somewhere else because we've sampled all this population, uh, but of course we don't know where the juveniles from that population are going. Uh, to scale it up, we ought to connect the dots to look at the exchanges between the reefs here. Um, the idea now is not just to measure the self-recruitment in each one, but actually to look at the exchange between adjacent populations and look at how one reef is how, how dependent neighbouring reefs are, I guess, effectively uh, on each other. Uh, we started out doing all this work on uh, small benthic species like Nemo, because basically we figured that if we can't tag larvae and find them again uh, for species like this, then it's not really worth trying for anything else, and we wanted to, to maximise the kind of information we can get. And these species are actually becoming sort of icons of reef fish diversity. Uh, moved on to sort of your more typical reef fish like butterfly fish, which have a longer larval duration, and uh, we also uh, now have moved on to some of the more real reef fish, the ones that people uh, eat. And we'll, if I get a, I'm going to mainly focus on these today, but if I get a chance, I'll mention some of our results here. Um, the work I'll talk about comes from studies in special places. Um, so I'll be talking about Pimby Bay on the northern side of New Britain and Papua New Guinea, some work done at Bootless Bay and uh, hopefully this time down to the Keppels. And in Pimby Bay, it truly is paradise on earth here. I'll be focusing on two islands largely in this area. Uh, and here's the, the first result. So we first started looking at the panda clownfish. We found a uh, population of these things around this island called Schumann Island. They tend to be associated with the sand flats around these islands and you can pretty much find every individual in the population. And so we did that. Uh, fin clip the adults to, to fingerprint them and collected uh, our juveniles to, to work out where they might be coming from. Uh, this species has a sort of a 10 to 12 day larval duration so there's plenty of time for them to disperse away from this 
area if they wanted. But what we found was in 2003, actually a third of them were coming back to the same little population around that island. So they were derived from parents uh, in that area. Um, and that, at that time, was the smallest scale of dispersal really known to a reef fish. Where were the other 70% coming from? We don't know. This is a big problem because we couldn't find in Kimby Bay anywhere another significant population of that species. So the 70% so the are obviously dispersing a very long way. Uh, we moved on to Nemo on Kimby, at Kimby Island Reserve um, to, to pick a species where we might be able to get a better chance of looking at connectivity. Um, this is a much larger population that's found in the lagoons around the island here and uh, we've found in three years now of doing the DNA fingerprinting and parentage analysis that somewhere between 40% and 60% of all the juveniles that turn up at this island come from parents on that island. So it's very much a self-sustaining population but with an influx of, of juveniles from who knows where. Uh, but it's more interesting than that, in fact, because what we're finding is that actually a lot of these juveniles are not just coming back to the same island, uh, they're coming back to the same little lagoon where they were born. And uh, we're also getting some coming in from other places as well. But a much greater percentage than you would think are actually recruiting very locally back into the same lagoon as their, their parents. But we never get happy scenes like this. And, and there's been no circumstance yet in the four or five years that we've been doing this that a juvenile will ever settle on the same anemone as its parents. Uh, we're putting a lot of effort into um, trying to figure out why and how they uh, find their way home because we know where they're born and we know where they settle but sort of the path they take in between and how they're finding their way home is still a mystery to us. Um, we don't know if the recruits that are uh, returning home are any happier, um, but we do know that uh, um, there is p one potential advantage of actually being able to return home, and that is a lot of these juveniles seem to grow faster. So the self-recruiters, at least in their early, early stage on the reef or in their early life, are growing faster than the ones that have migrated from somewhere else. That's the only difference we can find. Um, in terms of uh, how they're finding their way home, uh, Phil mentioned this morning that we think smell. They have a very sophisticated sense of smell and a lot of our experiments have shown that uh, they can find these, oh, they, they're sensitive, they can smell island water, they can smell beach water, they can actually distinguish home island water from water taken from somewhere else. Um, home lagoons, they can even recognise their home lagoon water compared to the lagoon on the other side of the island. Uh, and then we conspecifics, and they show this thing of strong avoidance of parents and, in fact, siblings, which might explain why they're never found on the same anemone or uh, as their parents or with their brothers and sisters. Um, but that's just coming back to Kimby Island. So obviously we had all these parents typed at Kimby Island, so we're searching around the bay to sort of figure out what's the sort of connectivity between these populations. And uh, we've now started finding offspring from Kimby Island that have settled pretty much uh, around here, but they basically go to these populations that are on other islands, and so we're finding small numbers, but uh, these are significant numbers, like uh, Kimby Island explains 6% of the recruitment that's happening here, 12% of the recruitment here, and so on. So I sort of feel like that is, is a significant amount of interpopulation dependence just between these adjacent populations. But these are distances of about 20, 30, 35, 40 kilometres. A, a single larvae could be, must be swimming uh, over a kilometre, uh, several kilometres a day to make that uh, journey in its sort of 10 to 12 day duration. Um, the other reason that this is uh, interesting or important is because these places that we've been sampling are actually nodes of uh, the proposed TNC Marine Protected Area Network for that area. So it's actually showing that these populations within different reserves around uh, Kimby Bay are connected, um, at least for this kind of species. Um, 
A year later, we were able to get to these other populations, and now we've actually got DNA fingerprints for all the adults in these three populations, just to show that we're getting a lot of self-recruitment here, a lot of self-recruitment here. It's much more marginal here, and we are also getting movement between these populations. It's looking like Pinby Island may, in fact, be a, a source, important source for recruits on the coast. Uh, move on to another reef fish. This is a vagabond butterfly fish. Um, so this, this is a very different fish because it has a larval duration of 35 days. So it's out there for a heck of a long time. And amazingly, what we discover is, and we've done this two years now, one with barium tagging and one with parentage, that in both cases we came up with an estimate of something like 60% of the juveniles of these fish, this fish species, are coming back to the same island as their parents, even though they've been out there for, for a long time. Just how they're doing that and what they're doing in between, um, we don't know. We're still working on. Um, and we're also most recently found exchange again between, we get a lot of self-recruitment of this thing at this island and we've also picked up um, movement of juveniles through the larval phase to these other two populations, so distances of 20, 30 kilometres, actually fairly similar pattern to the, to the clownfish. Uh, I'll move on to my fourth example, we wanted to look at this panda clownfish thing again but find some populations that where we could actually look at the connectivity and this time we're looking at, uh, we moved down to Bootless Bay, where we, f we um, have got five separate populations, a pretty small population. One of, them's, one of them's in a nominal kind of closed area or green zone, although there's no compliance in this area. I usually say here that it's, it's called Bootless Bay, but we've actually found them nesting on old shoes. And <laughs> actually, actually, they prefer beer bottles to nest on in this area. Uh, so we got these five populations and basically we were able to DNA fingerprint everything in that area. Uh, and this is the pattern we've got. We've got light movement of juveniles. We've got self-recruitment into some of these little populations. We've got movement between them pretty much in every direction. Um, movement in and out of this green zone. Um, so the, the fish, protect, well, if they were protected in here, they would be supplying juveniles to other places, but overall a relatively low percentage self-recruitment for that area. 75% were coming from somewhere else, and so we spent a lot of time now trying to figure out where are these other 75% uh, coming from. We found two other significant populations down the coast towards Port Moresby, and uh, DNA fingerprinted them and looked at the juveniles and traced where their parents were, and these lines just trace the movement of juveniles back to where their parents were. And again, we've just got this connectivity between these populations in different directions. But still, we're still not explaining everything, but um, we've sort of got a, a sort of scale. We're starting to get an idea of the scale of dispersal for, for a, a large percentage, I guess, of the, the population. Um, I will quickly mention the coral trout stuff. Do, do we are we actually able to use these kind of techniques to trace whether or not coral trout are moving, uh, providing larvae that are uh, settling locally or uh, um, outside green zones? And this is early days for this research, um, but we, with a bunch of students like and, and Dave Williamson and so on, we've been actually going to some green zones at the Keppel Islands and doing barium tagging. Um, of the adults in those zones, and the idea is to, to find out are those green zones contributing to the sort of local fishery in that area. So far we've only found one of each tagged, which uh, it's promising in the sense that at least we know we can use this technique and we can find the juveniles uh, again, but uh, um, one stripy snapper was tagged, his parents were, it was tagged here, his parents were injected with barium there and uh, the juvenile was found there, so these are fairly local scale movements. Um, one just went to, was born on one side of the island and ended up on the other side of the, the island. So we're pretty hopeful we're going to find more. We've got a lot of more samples to turn through there. But uh, if I just uh, plot for the species, I've got a reasonable amount of data for, so the two clownfish and the butterfly fish. This is just the distribution of known dispersal tracks for these species, um, and, uh, and that's the distance classes. So we've got them basically settling pretty close to home, but not right you know, where their parents were, through to about 30 kilometers 
Um, so quite a high percentage are settling within one or two kilometres, so that's pretty much the self-recruitment figures that we're getting. And these other peaks, they just represent where we're finding other significant populations, so it's fairly mo multimodal. Uh, and so it's, this is not a dispersal curve, but it maybe gives us an idea of what that, that curve might, might look like. Um, and we don't know how far that extends, but we think it's demographically significant at least to 30 kilometres, and we wanted to see you know, how much further we can, we can take that. Yeah, so the uh, emerging picture really is something that looks like that. Um, some sort of beast with a long neck and a long tail. We don't really know how far the tail goes yet, but even within species, we're finding significant self-recruitment sort of within one or two kilometers. We're also getting quite a lot of uh, dispersal on scales of 20 to 30 kilometers within a single species. And there doesn't seem to be that much difference, at least so far, between the species uh, that we're, we're looking at. Um, I think it's a good dispersal strategy for resilience. I'm hoping this is a positive sign for these reef fishes because it means they can sustain themselves potentially through their own self-recruitment and self-replenishment, but they can, they're also capable of colonizing and recolonizing damaged in areas and so on. So uh, uh, potentially they can move if they have to in terms of things like climate change. And I do see that we can achieve these multiple benefits of marine reserves because we're getting larvae staying within green zones. So you can have an individual sanctuary that's self-sustaining. There's definitely enough exchange on the scale that, that green zones can supply blue zones. And if you're, if you're in the lucky situation we are with the GBR, there's certainly that, at that scale going to be a lot of connectivity between the different green zones or nodes in the, in the park. Credits and sponsors, thank you very much.